I remember being in your shoes. 20 years ago, I was applying to the academy. I was right where you are now. And the best part is that 20 years later, now, today, uh, I get to coach people all day, every day, like you. This is all we do, and we have a lot of fun doing it. The last three years, 100% of our clients have earned congressional nominations. 94% have earned either an academy appointment or an ROTC scholarship. So no one, most are never paying for college and are going to be officers. And over 83% last year earned academy appointments. That's fun. Winning is fun. So if you follow what we teach, I believe you will significantly improve your chances. In fact, I promise you will. I'm that confident. Uh, the best data we have out there is it's around a 10% chance of getting into the academy. Okay. Um, 83% is significantly improving your odds. I want all of you, whether you're an Academy Endeavors client or you never sign up with us, I want you to benefit significantly from this presentation. And I wanna answer your questions afterwards because I believe that getting into Academy is a game changer in your young life. I believe it gives you a significant head start in life that sets you up for future success like almost no other institution in America can. And I think I can prove that pretty clearly. Okay. Uh, but here's the problem, and it is a problem. This is the most complex admissions process in the country. No college admissions process requires as much of you as academies do, period. It's not even close. It's not even close. So if I can input my brain into yours over the next hour on what you need to do to become an attractive candidate, whether you are a junior, whether you are a sophomore, whether you are a freshman, whether you are in middle school and you are on this call, I want to impute how I think doing this all day, every day into your brain so that you can start working on that now while there is still time left. If you're a senior and you're already applying, you're waiting, you're waiting to find out. Or maybe you're gonna reapply or you've already heard bad news and you're gonna reapply. Then in this case, it's, there is still time left. But for, but for most second semester seniors, there is no time left. They're simply waiting. Their application is done, okay? But you, if you're a junior, sophomore, freshman, or if you're reapplying, you, there is still time left. There is something you can do. Okay, so here's my thesis tonight, because we're going to share Academy Endeavors data on who's been getting in and who isn't, and what are the common themes of those that are getting in or are not. Okay, so here's, here's my thesis. The best data we have, said it before, there's about a 10% chance of getting into the Academy, and there's a million reasons why many fail. But we're going to share compelling data on two of the most crucial reasons. And if you're taking notes, write this down. Not enough leadership positions on your resume. Not enough leadership positions. It's one. Number two, not a high enough SAT, ACT score. Okay. We're going to dig a lot of time into that. Okay. Now for you PhD statisticians in the room or wannabe statisticians in the room, this is not a dissertation on z-values and p-values and standard deviation of blah, blah, blah. This is from a practitioner who's been in the trenches with families, who's celebrated with a lot and cried with a few who've lost, celebrated with a lot who won, cried with a few who lost, and went back and looked at the trends to see the correlations and see what's going on between the winners and the looters. We're in our fourth year. Okay, so we got quite a bit of data. And we know everything about these candidates that are getting in. We're even going to show you mass data, masked. So we're going to take off high schools, take off names, et cetera, of two clients, two, two previous clients, one who got in, one who didn't, that were both white male, both came from the same congressional district, who got in and who didn't and why. And what we surmise to be the core reasons why. Okay. So first, before we even get into that, we need to share a powerful framework that answers the question, what do academies even care about? 
What do they care about most? We have to get inside their brain and think like they do. We have to think like the admissions board. Okay, and I told you in it that we're not sharing slides. When we talked about that on social, we talked about that on over email. We're not sharing slides. So you're gonna have to write down these seven pillars. This is called the seven pillars of sensational candidates. Pillar number one. We believe academies really care about of these seven things, they care about this academic robustness. Now, when we say academic robustness, we mean the ability to communicate to admissions that you can withstand the academic rigor at the academy. Academies are world-class STEM institutions. So through your transcript and through your SAT or ACT score, can you prove or can you make a convincing argument that you can withstand the academic rigor at the academy, okay? Are you gonna flunk out of chemistry or calculus the first year? Are you gonna be one of those guys? Are you gonna be a problem, academic probation type person? Not good, right? Okay. Um, all right, so that's academic robustness. Number two, pillar. Pillar number two, leadership experience. The Dean of Naval Academy admissions said this, he said it best. We believe, this quote, we believe leadership is a skill that you can get better at by doing it. So we look for applicants who have experience leading. Makes perfect sense to me. Question is, will you have the confidence to take charge and can you conv convey a compelling argument through your resume that you fit into the world-class leadership laboratories and their stated missions of building leaders of character. Are you building yourself right now as a candidate to sell yourself to admissions that aligns with this world-class leadership institution? Maybe the, maybe the most prestigious in the world. Maybe number one is these service academies. Okay. Number three pillar, pillar number three of seven athletic participation the military is a team sport it's a team sport and as an officer you will be team captain you'll be playing team captain over enlisted do you have athletic participation can you be a team player do you know how to grind with a competitive spirit that tests you physically and mentally and emotionally their mantra is every cadet is an athlete every midshipman is an athlete don't let there be any lack of athletic participation in your profile, lest they become concerns that you don't have the competitive edge that they are looking for. Athletic participation is number three. Number four is fitness and medical dependability. Listen, they're not giving you a $300,000 scholarship for you to be medically unable to deploy. If you have a condition that disallows you from serving downrange in harm's way, then Dobmerb ain't having it. Dodmerb is Department of Defense Medical Evaluation Review Board. Okay, they're going to review your medical record or at least what you submit of your medical record. By passing your CFA, by becoming medically qualified, you need to, you are communicating you have the medical and fitness dependability. Number five, that's number four, fit, fitness and medical dependability. The fifth pillar in the seven pillars of sensational candidates is credible enthusiasm and character you say you might say you want to serve but does your resume and track record show that what's your story your enthusiasm must be credible must be believable your story must be believable as to why you want to serve they don't want you to quit on the first day of basic training because it quote wasn't what you signed up for do you know what you're getting yourself into truly and can you show that in story format, in an interview, or in an essay, by how you live your life infused with the core values already, even before the academy, when it's inconvenient? Can you display that in an interview question, such as, tell me about a time you, your integrity was tested. Credible enthusiasm and character. They'll be able to see this in your interviews, essays, and letters of recommendation. You need to prove that in your story. Number six, so fifth, fifth pillar is credible enthusiasm and character. 
the sixth pillar that academies care about, that they're looking for. This is their brain. This is their admission. This is what's going on in admissions. Okay. Is diversity. Okay. Now, when I say that, I'm saying ethnicity and gender and talent proficiency. Hear me clearly. They do not want a homogenous class. Yes, this includes ethnicity and gender, but it also includes recruited athletes, people with private pilot's license, okay, or scuba license, okay, people that have talent and proficiency that they're looking for as well. It's both. It's all of the above, okay? Officer ranks should be representative of the country as a whole and the enlisted that they lead. Okay. I'd also put military experience in there. There are some that are coming from enlisted ranks. There are some are coming from the National Guard. That would be also something they're looking for, military experience. Or ROTC, they're coming, they're reapplying from ROTC or JROTC. That would be another example of diversity or talent or military propensity. All right, and that's, so the sixth is diversity. And the seventh pillar is geographic representation. Seventh pillar of sensational candidates, geographic representation. Federal Title X regulations say that for all 435 districts in the US, if there's a qualified candidate in, in, that, in each district, at least one offer, appointment offer will be granted, okay? So they don't want to be grossly overrepresented in a few metropolitan areas. That is extremely unique to service academies and only service academies. They want to represent America as a whole, and rightfully so. This will be determined by the nomination process. So here's your seven. Academic robustness. Prove that through your transcript and SAT and ACT. Leadership experience. Prove that through your resume and some of your stories. Athletic participation, prove that through your athletic activities, varsity sports, club sports. Four, fitness and medical dependability, prove that through your CFA and Dobner. Five, credible enthusiasm and character, prove that through your essays, your interviews, and your letters of recommendation. Six, diversity, they're going to notice that through your application. Okay, that's going to be clear as day on your application. And seven, geographic representation, that's proved through your nomination source. All right. Now that you've learned the seven pillars and what they care about, okay, I want to dive into one of the pillars or two of those pillars that I said at the outset that was our thesis for tonight. And that is a lack of leadership experience. Okay. And I want to do this. I want to harp on lack of leadership experience as a huge problem for young people that don't get accepted by illustrating two resumes, okay? And I'm gonna show these resumes now, all right? And this was a few years ago, okay? We're gonna call him Alex, okay? This is Alex, all right? Um, by the way, these two resumes, they were real candidates, but one got in and the other did not. Both were from the same congressional district, both were white male, both passed their CFA, both earned congressional nominations, both applied to the same academy. Which one was the winner and why? First resume, Alex, 3.67 unweighted GPA, 31 SAT, not bad. It, taking advanced classes, four sport varsity athlete, team captain in three of those sports, black belt, student council, president of FCA, president of philosophy club, president of classical society, went to Boys State, went to summer seminar. That is it in a nutshell. Now we're gonna to go to Brian. Brian, 4.0 GPA, 1460 SAT, taking Calc 2, Chinese 5, Eagle Scout, patrol leader, varsity baseball player, black belt, president of the chess club. Alex? Brian. Who did the Academy admissions choose? And the answer is they chose Alex, candidate number one. Now, please understand me. Please understand me. Both candidates are fantastic. And that's the problem in admissions. They're 
are close calls. Two outstanding candidates and you only have one slot. What do you do? This is welcome to admissions. This is what they do all day long. Okay. Now, if I were to step into the admissions board brain, the committee, this is what I would say. This was their synopsis. Alex was not as smart as Brian, but he met the threshold of being smart enough to academically succeed. He passed the academic robustness test. He was taking advanced classes. He was not a slouch by any means. 31 ACT, so he was at the mean and 3.67 unweighted GPA, a little bit below the mean, but it's not a slouch by any means. But he overcame that through his athletics and his extracurricular and leadership. Who is actually the better leader? Who has demonstrated they're the better leader and the most leadership experience? And that was clearly Alex. Brian, if you look closely, you can make the case that he actually never led in anything significant. Now, senior patrol leader is usually the one that is leading out, at least that they say in Boy Scouts. So patrol leader is this less significant leadership position. So historically doesn't count as much. Okay, president of a club still, but it was a chess club and we're gonna get into why it's maybe not as many points as leading out on your varsity sports team. I think you can understand why that might be, but we're gonna talk more about it. But at the end of the day, even though Brian was smarter, he didn't have enough leadership chops to make it over the top. The importance of leadership experience. I think that clearly shows it. Now I'm gonna give you some data. The data backs this up. Of those that have been admitted that we know of, that Academy Endeavors is aware of, the number of significant leadership roles, 4.9 leadership roles per candidate. Okay, so about five on average. Five, that we're talking team captain of a sports team would be one. President or vice president or treasurer or secretary of student council would be two. You know, uh, vice president of MUN would be three. We're, we're talking clubs, community organizations, um, Civil Air Patrol Cadet Commander, okay? We're talking clubs on campus, community organizations off campus, sports teams on campus, okay? Extracurricular, school or non-school. All right, now get this. The number of significant leadership roles for those that did not get in, that we're aware of, 1.8. <laughs> 4.9 versus 1.8. That is a strong correlation. I'm not a PhD statistician, but that's pretty dang strong, okay? So your follow-up question might be, well, what is significant? I'm gonna give you a framework or just a simple two-word analysis on that that I want you to even use on yourself. Two things are important, selective and recognizable. Those are the two words. Okay, so selective organizations. Was he, are you a leader or was he a leader in selective organizations? Meaning, is it an organization that just takes any warm body, i.e. the chess club? Or is there some selectivity involved, i.e. a student council, you're running for an elected position, NHS, usually highly selective. Your sports team's highly selective. The more selective, the higher amount of a points associated. Keep in mind, every activity that you do at the, that you put on the academy admissions, uh, that you put on your academy application is quantified. There's a, quantif there's a quantification, there's, a, there's an analysis that's being done. Now, at the end of the day, people are making the decision on whether you get into the academy, not computers. However, we need to understand the algorithm to be in a better position so that those people on the admissions board can make a favorable decision towards you, okay? So that's selective, selective. Is there some selectivity in how they're making these organizations? Are they selective organizations? I mentioned student council versus the knitting club. That's just an example, okay? Now, the more recognizable, the better too. Has admissions even heard of this organization? Okay. 
if you're vice president of the Memorial Day Beach Challenge, uh, I'm not so sure they've heard of that. We're gonna. You might need to take a couple extra three steps to under to explain what that organization even is in the sub bullet, and you only get 250 characters. It's tough. Okay, um, 250 characters in the application part of the resume part. So everyone's heard of Boy Scouts. Everyone's heard of Girl Scouts. Everyone's heard of Student Council. Everyone's heard of National Honor Society. There are certain drop down menus in these academy applications. And in those drop down menus, they're giving the national organizations and the things most people are doing. If you do something outside of that and you lead outside of that, it's going to be tough for the admissions board to understand what that is. And when it's a close call between you and many other people, like what you saw in the candidate comparison we just showed you earlier, the more recognizable, the more name recognition, the stronger the brand, the stronger the brain or the admissions board is gonna go, yes, got it, that's significant, points, okay? And there's points already loaded in the algorithm for that, okay? So selectivity and recognizability are very important when it comes to how significant your leadership positions are. You wanna be seeking out leadership positions in selective and recognizable organizations, ideally. But when in doubt, just get something. For, remember, 4.9 versus 1.8, 4.9 winners, 1.8 losers. What are you going to do now to aggressively pursue those on your campus? Now, understand this is a path. So if you're a freshman or you're in middle school, you're a sophomore, leadership is a path. You don't just show up and you don't just lead out sometimes. It takes time. You got to put in your dues. Okay. But are you on that path to where you have that vision to where you can see yourself by your junior year achieving or securing those leadership positions? That's the key. That's the key, because if you're not even in the game, if you're not even a member, if you're not even on the team, how do you expect to be the team captain the next year? If you're not even in the club, if you're not even showing up, you got to show up. And freshman and sophomore year is about showing up more, more than anything to put yourself in the position to win the rapport of the decision makers to eventually be in that position junior or senior year. Okay, I'm going to give you a bonus. So there's selectivity, recognizability, but a bonus, uh, bonus one would be alignment. Get involved in activities that are aligned with the academy's mission. STEM activities, fitness activities, military activities. I'll give you an example, STEM, robotics. I'll give you an example of military, sea cadets, Civil Air Patrol, JROTC. Give you an example of... Uh, Give you an example of fitness. The best example would be varsity sports. Okay. Um, there's more than just those three categories. However, the more aligned the activity is, the more likely it's going to speak to the admissions board's heart. Okay. Now, pro tip here's what we've learned it's not as important that you have to be president. The main thing is that you get on the leadership team, become an officer in the club. Be on the executive board. Be treasurer, be secretary. That still matters. It's not necessarily president or bust. It's officer or bust or, or senior leader or bust. The point is, don't just be a member. Don't just show up and do the volunteer service hours. Lead out in the volunteer service project. Especially for you juniors and seniors. That's the key. Okay. You want to be one of the top people in the organization because that's what officers do. Now, I have to give this disclaimer because there's a human element to this. Nobody likes when someone's just out for themselves. That's part of the character piece. So when you're obtaining these leadership positions, it's about how you do it as well. Are you serving to make an impact or are you all about yours? Don't get me wrong. You join this because you have a, you want to get into the academy. You have a goal. You have a dream. And I want to help you get there. So don't get me wrong. There is a mission. There is a, a, a purpose here. But how you go about it in stepping on people or in serving people is a subtle but big difference. So I understand garnering leadership positions can come off as selfish. Okay. It's the manner in which you do it that matters. 
Here's the bottom line, guys. Get leadership positions, period. And when given a choice, the more selective, the more recognizable, and the more aligned, the better. But at the end of the day, get them. All right? Okay. Moving on from leadership positions. The next data point, the next thesis that significantly improves your odds, and we have data to back this up, is your SAT, ACT score. SAT and ACT, they both matter, either one. You, you, they're interchangeable. But the point is, get as high of an SAT or ACT score as possible. Now, this actually, you think, oh yeah, duh. No, no, uh, it's not a duh, because most colleges, not all colleges, have waived that requirement. The academies have not. The academies, it is mandatory, and it's going to stay that way. Okay? Our data shows that getting significantly above the mean, the mean is 1350 SAT, 31 ACT, okay? You want to get significantly above the mean. Um, unless one of these factors is at play. You're a recruited athlete, you're an underrepresented minority, or you're from it an underrepresented district and you know it, which is really hard to tell, but underrepresented minority and recruited athlete, yes, there are exceptions, okay? But if that is not you, then plan on getting a 1400 or above or a 32 or above to get accepted because that's what it's gonna take and just tell you right now. There are too few slots to go around to give slots to below the mean candidates, okay? Now listen to this stat. Of those admitted that Academy Endeavors is aware about, is aware of the average SAT for those admitted was a 1398 average. Okay, so basically a 1400. Okay, of those that weren't 1296, over a hundred point difference between those that were and those that weren't. Okay, now here's the problems we see. So it's pretty convincing data. Now here's the problems we see young people worry about their grades too much and the SAT, ACT, not enough. I'll say it again. Young people worry about their grades too much and the SAT, ACT, not enough. They don't prioritize it because no one's holding their feet to the fire of what SAT score they are. But every day you show up to class, your teacher is holding your feet to the fire and every exam and all that. And so you're being held accountable by the system, the school that you're showing up to every day. But you don't have an SAT school. <laughs> you don't have an ACT school. It's on you or your tutor if you have one, which we highly suggest, by the way. Okay? So no one's holding you accountable, and therefore it goes by the wayside. As soon as you get busy, your SAT book go, gets pushed to the side, telling you that's a mistake. It's a mistake. Don't, you, they don't prioritize it enough. Problem number two with the SAT, ACT, is they wait too long to get started. When we coach underclassmen, we have an underclassmen package, we have a, it's our fastest growing package. We love working with freshmen and sophomores. When we work with them, the first thing we talk about, let's get a plan for when you're gonna take that test, for what tutoring you're gonna get, let's refer you to some tutors that, that are a good fit for you. Let's figure out uh, the plan, when that fits in best with your busy schedule. Let's get really purposeful and let's get it all charted out on a timeline. We get that in their 360 plan is what we call it, okay? Why do we do that? Because we know in their algorithm about 30%, if not more, 30 to 40%, some say, is attributed to that one score. Of the total 100% admission score, 30% is attributed just to that, not even counting transcript and sports and leadership roles and all that, okay? So it's the single biggest factor in terms of the algorithm, at least, all right? So don't wait too long to get started. If you're a freshman and you're on this call, it is not too early, okay, to at least look into tutors or take the PSAT or even take the real SAT. You can take the SAT as many times as you want. You can take the ACT, I believe, up to 12 times. All right? The academies look at only your highest math and your highest verbal, and they combine it. It's called the super score. They're not going to penalize you for taking it multiple times. You're encouraged to take it multiple because you can super score your best sections. You need to get on that. Parents, if you're listening in, it's very important. Okay. All right. The number three problem we see is that they give up too soon. They take it three times and then they are over it. And listen, I don't blame you. Standardized testing can wear you out. I get it. 
but I've just, I'm going to, we're going to share a success story a little bit later, someone who followed our advice and really succeeded. And if you give up too soon, you, you leave points on the table. So I'm thoroughly convinced if you follow this plan, this three-step plan, you're going to be proud of your score. Take it early. Step one, take it early. Two, take it often. And three, take it seriously. So take it early. Start early. What we recommend is the real SAT your sophomore year, okay, to see where you're at. Now, PSAT, you can take all that. That's great. But the real SAT sophomore year to find out where you're at, give that as a diagnostic to the tutor. Start tutoring summer going into your junior year and then take it three times. You just need to write this down. Okay, so there's some steps involved. Okay, take the real SAT your sophomore year, get tutoring summer before your junior year, and then your first semester junior year, take it three times before December of your junior year. Well, why do I say that's the timeline? One, if you start too soon, if you actually get on a plan and start tuning it too soon and you haven't even taken Algebra 2 yet, there's Algebra 2 on the standardized tests. And so you're not going to maximize your score without taking Algebra 2 first. Okay, so likely is <clears throat> a lot of folks are taking Algebra 2 as a sophomore. And so we wait for them to get tutoring and actually take the real thing, like get serious about the real test their first semester of junior year. Okay, so they're waiting to take all the required classes. Um, <clears throat> but if you start too late, what happens is you get into AP exams, final exams, college applications, congressional nominations, fitness, medical, the whole thing just starts erupting <laughs> on you. And you're super busy second semester junior year and first semester senior year. You want to bite this elephant one bite at a time and get it knocked out if you can. And taking it three times is usually what you'll need to super score it. And the third reason why we recommend this timeline of taking it three times before December of your junior year is because summer seminar applications open as early as December. And they ask what your SAT, ACT score is. And you're going to get a better chance of getting a summer seminar if you have a score you're proud of. Okay. so. Those are the reasons why you take it early. Take it often is number two step. Take practice tests on Khan Academy. It's free and it's in conjunction with the college board. Get a profile on Khan Academy and take them for free. Okay, now get your set, get in a place where you can take the three hour test uninterrupted as, as well. And then when you get with a tutor, you can pick it off and work with the problem sets and the stuff you're struggling on, which actually leads us to number three, which is take it seriously. <clears throat> we think you should get a professional tutor. If you followed what we said by taking the real test sophomore year, then by the time you get into tutoring, you'll be able to show them your real scores. You get into a study rhythm, use the summer to your advantage, and you crush it your first semester. Why do we say first semester? Because of summer seminar applications. Also because second semester, you're dealing with AP exams at the end of met or beginning of may and then final exams at the end of may and then voila you're just and then summer going into your senior year you're now going to boys state girls state summer seminar all this and you have an incredibly busy summer you're also if you do what we teach your team captain and your leader leader of five different organizations you run around with your head cut off get the sat under your belt and get it over with okay now here's our success story of somebody who applied what we taught and it really worked out for them Okay. When he first came to us, he reached out through our website. We set up a phone, uh, a Google Meet call. Um, he had an 1190 SAT, no leadership position, one varsity sport. Um, we had a conversation with him, tried to help as much as we could, but we turned him down. He didn't qualify for Academy Endeavors, and we gave him a list of things to do. We said, come back and see us when you've done these five things. Okay. Now, so many people we say that to, they never come back. But this young man, three months later, he came back. He had improved his SAT a little bit. He had obtained a few leadership positions. And we said, okay, let's, let's sign the agreement. Let's get to work. So he signed up for our program. Through the course of our coaching, um, he saw how far he still needed to go. He ran four and one, vice president of his DECA club. He got team captain of his baseball team. Became a manager at work where he was overseeing the staff. He joined Sea Cadets. And together, we worked hard to get his applications in early. We polished his essays, professional interview preparation, the whole bit. 
give him the best chance of getting a nomination. He earned his congressional nomination. Um, he retook his SAT three more times. He ended up with a 1350. Last January, West Point emailed him the best news of his life, that he got an appointment to United States Military Academy. Now he's a plebe. So this, this is a success story in a nutshell. I mean, that was a very shortened version of someone who was really intentional about leadership and SAT scores, among other things, to transform himself into a candidate that West Point wants. All right, so now we, we talked about SAT scores, we talked and SAT, ACT scores, we talked about leadership positions. I wanna quickly run through a host of other things that you're gonna to wanna to be aware of or beware of and avoid these common pitfalls. The list is, I'm gonna fly through these before we get to some Q and A. The list is 12 long, okay? Because that's not all you need to do. I'm giving you two things that are big rocks, but I'm also gonna give you 12 more things that if you mess up could screw you over, all right? And it just so happens that I don't know how often these things happen as much because our clients nail these things because our system takes care of them um, and our coaching takes care of them. But so the number one problem that I want you to avoid is procrastination. The typical senior in high school waits until the last minute. I know because I used to be one and I coach them for a living. But the academies are rolling admissions. OK, so if you turn it in last minute, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Because rolling admissions means they are actively reserving seats in the class on an ongoing basis. So he who submits first, or she who submits first, all other things being equal, has an advantage. Ideally, you want to time it so you submit things over the summer before your senior year begins. Okay, why do I say that? Well, it increases your chances of an LOA, a letter of assurance. Academies do something called letters of assurance. It's basically early notification of admission pending a nomination or contingent upon a nomination that you don't even have a nomination at this point, but they're reserving you a seat in the class. It's extremely valuable. And they're saying, we're going to reserve this seat if you get your nomination and if you get Dodmer qualified. Okay, last year, 75% of our clients got an LOA. Why? Well, they're outstanding. They're outstanding candidates, yes. And they turn their stuff in early. We had it all done before August 31st. If you sign up for our program, you will have, if you're a junior in high school and you sign up for our pro program, you will get everything done before August 31st. Okay. Why? Increases your chances of an LOA, also increases your chances of getting medically through the process because it's a long process. And last, and this is the intangible that most people don't realize, because first semester senior year is a hell of a lot of work. If you can get it done before you start your high school, then you focus on one thing at a time. Once again, that's the theme, focusing on one thing at a time, okay? So procrastination, something to avoid. It'll kill you because of rolling admissions. Number two of 12, not knowing what you're getting yourself into. We see it all too often. You say you want to go to the academy, but you've never visited. You didn't apply to summer seminar. You don't know any majors or future careers of interest. You can't talk intelligently about academy life and so interviewers can sniff it out and your intrinsic motivation to serve must be credible in our program we guide you on how to build your story so it's credible and along the way we advise all clients to visit the academies help them with their summer seminar application introduce them or uh, or to to other cadets or former cadets or midshipmen so they can know exactly what they're getting themselves into okay, there's a 20 percent attrition rate historically for all academies you think Academy Admissions Department want to feed into that? No, they want to avoid that. They're trying to get that down to zero. And one of the best ways they can do that is by making sure they pass the you know what you're getting yourself into test. And that better be credible and tight. And if you, with us, we'll make sure it is. Number three problem to avoid <clears throat> is candidates wing it on the interviews. Most 17 year olds follow the just be yourself advice. I got news, 17 year old just being themselves is not impressive to a veteran interviewer. In our program, we're gonna give you the frequently asked questions. We're gonna nudge you on what A plus answers look like and then practice with you in a game like environment until you master it. If you're doing it on your own, 
then I suggest you follow that path and try to do it as best you can um, by practicing. Do not wing it. All right, number four, writing your essays the night before it's due. And, and don't get me wrong, I did that thousands of times in high school. But you think it's good to go because it's your best, but you don't know what good looks like. You just don't. And, and so whether it's, if you're, if you're not going to go with us, what, you seek out some professional editing help, whether it's through teachers, okay, whether it's through officers that you know, get other eyes on it and plan ahead. In our program, we're very hands-on with essays. We teach you how to follow the STAR framework to tell your story in a compelling, concise way. We average three to five rounds per edits per essay because we do know what good looks like and we want to push you toward excellence. Okay, number five. This, you'll be shocked, but this is 100% true. Candidates leave out some of their accomplishments. They leave them out. They don't actually include them in the ad academy application. How do I know that? Because 100% of our clients, the last 100%, the last three years have done this mistake. We go through, we look at their resume, we look at their academy application, we do a final QC. We're like, why didn't you put that in there? Oh my gosh, I, I didn't even notice that. The final QC, most 17 year olds are doing this late at night by themselves and parents and other are just trusting that they got it all in there. No, no, do a final quality check. That's what we do for all our clients. We find mistakes all the time and help get them the maximum points for what they deserve. Believe it or not, it happens all the time because you can't just upload your PDF resume. You have to transfer it over and you're forgetting accomplishments and you're leaving things out and you're leaving points on the table. Number six mistake that we see, not understanding the nuances of your congressional district, how competitive it is, whether they use the principal or competitive method, what method they use, how your preference list matters. In our program, we do an in-depth congressional district analysis and we give you feedback on what it takes to win. Okay, 100% of our clients have earned congressional nominations. There are nuances to every district. Be aware of that. Number seven, common one for underclassmen. Either taking not enough challenging classes or actually this is even more common, taking too many challenging courses and not leaving enough time for leadership. The truth is it's a tough balancing act. And in our underclassmen program, we guide clients on what classes to take, whether it's too hard or too easy and what to do with their free time to bolster their resume. Okay, because there's only 24 hours in a day. We can't all be superstars in everything. So it is a balancing act and you need to know that. Number eight, <clears throat> pit common pitfall, de-emphasizing sports because you're super smart. Let's just face it, we see it with a lot of folks out there, especially ones that have a really high SAT, you know, 1500 plus, you know, valedictorian, and they just, they're in the books constantly. And that's what they're good at. And when they're not in the books, they don't really want to be in sports. That's not their thing. They're on the coding, doing Cyber Patriot or something like that. Great. Awesome. But let me just tell you, if you don't have a varsity letter or you're not on track to get one, you're making it really hard for yourself. Pick a sport and go for it. Pick an athletic activity and make, even if it's just one, and make that your thing. All right. Can't emphasize that enough. You're making it really hard on yourself. I'll give you a stat. West Point's class, 91% of the class had a varsity letter and 75% were a team captain of that varsity sport. Okay, so if you want to think you'll be part of that 9%, good luck, but I wouldn't put my money there. Number, number nine, they can't get a waiver for medical because they don't know what Dobmer is looking for. This is a tough one. Dobmer is a black box, okay? Um, here, you, you got to know what's in your medical record and you have to read that sucker. You got to request it, read it, and then understand, oh my gosh, the doctor said that. I didn't even realize that. Okay. You're, you're going off a of memory when you went to the ER. Oh, that's what the doctor said. What they wrote down is something different. What they wrote down is actually what matters. In our program, we go in depth on medical record reviews to discover gaps in our client's medical record and seek to obtain new medical information that will shore up your case in front of Dobmer, think of it like you're in a legal battle and you got to convince a jury, all right? Um, if you have a medical condition that is disqualifying, 
identify that, pull the record, or have your parents help you, and then read that, okay? Number 10, we're almost there. Lack of explanation on what you've done and why it matters. Don't ever assume that by just saying what you've done, people understand the impact of what you did. You have to tell them. Your story matters. Never assume. Never assume that. Um, in our program, we, you gotta, we help you strike a balance between being humble to a fault or being too pompous, okay? If you're not with us, you're gonna have to do that. You're gonna have to strike that balance on your own or re reach out to mentors because we're telling a story. We have to tell a story that academies wanna hear. And if you just shy away from everything you've done, they're not gonna get it, okay? They're flying through these applications. There's 10,000 of them per academy. Number 11, anxiety about the CFA, but they never actually practice it. Think about that. Never actually practice it, but they're anxious about it. You don't even know where you stand until you do a mock. Okay? You got to get out there and do the six events. And we're going to help you with that later. Uh, for those that showed up, you guys are going to get something from us that will help you. And number 12, they get burned out. They just lose steam. I see it in the fall of senior year. They're just like, it's too much. It's too much. Your why needs to be clear and it needs to be reinforced. And we're going to help you with that as well. So we didn't get this far, 50 minutes in, you hung in there. Okay, hopefully you took some notes and learned a lot, um, but you didn't get this far just to listen, did you? Nope, you have some work to do. I'm gonna give you an assignment, okay? Um, to, tonight, we're gonna give you one free giveaway and then over email tomorrow, we're gonna give you another two. We're gonna give you three things for free, all right? Okay, the first one that I'm gonna actually have Tori drop in the chat is to do your one page resume. Download from for free our resume template, which organizes your activities in five categories, the five, five categories that academies care about and start putting together your professional resume. Because here's the thing, you don't actually know what you look like on paper until you do it, until you get it all down and your brain can actually see it all. If it's two pages, fine, that's okay. Let's try to keep it to one page if possible, but this, this, and this template will help you do that. If it's one and a half, great, that's okay. The point is we gotta get everything down so our brain can see it. And then we go, oh, wow, I'm really lacking in this category. Well, these, those categories are essentially the way that they're viewing you so get it get it down in that same perspective so you can see it clearly i'm a big fan of getting things down on paper and looking at them if it's a google doc right it's a reward doc okay so it's not necessarily physical paper but get it down and start getting and start getting your family around and get everything all accomplishments on one sheet of music okay no better way to self-assess your candidacy than that now, if you sign up for the underclassmen program or pro, we're going to do that with you together. But we're going to give you that for free because we want you to succeed. Okay, so free resume template. The two things that are going to come to you via email tomorrow morning are first, a my why worksheet. Okay, this is going to guide you on getting your why, the why you want to attend the academy, very clear so that you can remind yourself often. It's also going to track your big wins. So you stay energized and motivated. What do I mean? Um, I'm actually gonna show this to you. So you can see what it looks like. Okay. So with all of our clients, and now with you guys, whether you're clients or not, um, I want you to get really clear on where you want to be and by when. Okay, so this might say Air Force Academy, and this might say May of 2026. Okay, and now I want you to get, I want you to follow these instructions, make them as personal as possible, and write your reasons in yellow. Three reasons. And generic is just not good enough. Generic's not, generic is not powerful. I want you to include childhood memories, heroes, personal experiences, heartfelt convictions. When you read it, it should make your heart pump out of your chest with passion. 
You signed up for this one hour call when you could have been doing homework. There's a reason why you're here. Get it on paper, print it out. I know you guys probably don't have printers. Ask your dad or mom, <laughs> print it out at work and bring it home. Get it on paper so you can put it on a wall and you can actually see the thing instead of having it hide on your computer, okay? Get this thing really, really clear and heartfelt, all right? And then big wins. I'm a huge believer in big wins. We have to, celebration is one of our core values as a company because we celebrate young people's success rather than being focused on the next thing, the next thing all the time. We have to stop, pause, and say, you know what? That was, some, that was a damn good effort right there. Like, great job. That was a huge win, okay? That, that fights burnout when you actually can pause and reflect and go, I had a big win in January. I increased my SAT 100 points. I had a big win in February. I made the varsity uh, track team. You know, I had a big win. You know, I, I got an A on that test uh, that, you know, I was, I was at a B and now I'm, at, now I'm at a B plus. And if I get another one, I'll be at A minus. Track your big wins. And this is going to help you. So get your Y down and then track your big wins. To keep your energy up and keep you motivated because you're going to need it. Because this is the longest application process in the country. It's not just the hardest. It's the longest. And, and so, uh, but by the, from, from start of summer seminar applications to the fine you actually, time you actually get notified, um, could be up to 16 months. That's just for juniors and seniors, not to mention if you're a freshman, this is where you want to end up three, four years from now. Okay. That's coming to you guys as a gift from Academy Endeavors. All right. <clears throat> the second thing is that we want to give you, we talked about it earlier that you pull this up, just give me a second, um, is that young people have anxiety about the CFA, the candidate fitness assessment, but they don't actually, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm trying to make sure I can find this. Here we go. Okay, but they don't actually do anything about it. They don't actually take the practice test. Um, well, now you have no excuse. Here we go. Because tomorrow morning you'll get this, which is the Academy Endeavor CFA workout plan. Okay, it's a gift for showing up today. Um, all right. And it's going to show you really clearly what's the max, what's the average, what's the min in each category, the instructions, it's your seven steps to success. Okay, you're going to take mocks. After you take your first mock, you're going to set your goals. Then you're going to take three more mocks. Okay, and then that's going to lead up to your real CFA. If you're a junior, if you're a junior, you're only going to take four mocks. If you're a freshman, you might take 18, you know, so this will only work for the next four you take. Um, but it not only has this plan for mocks, it's really clean and nice, but it also has a workout plan. Okay, so it's got two weeks of workouts that you can just recycle and reuse. Okay, um, it's got strength and, and running, and that's how that's how we do it. And it's even got a rest day, rest days, mock days. Okay, I've done this plan, right? I take the CFA every year with my clients during Academy Endeavors boot camp, try to beat their ass. <laughs> I'm almost 40 years old. I got to stay in shape. Um, so I, yeah, this is a gift to you guys and I hope it benefits you. Um, all right. So we'll get that delivered over email as a personal email to each of you. Um, and so <clears throat> here's what I wanted to say right before we go to Q and A, um, by the way, we're not going to, if it, we're going to go until nobody has any more questions and if people need to drop off early, they totally, you, you totally can. Um, but we're going to go until, until all the questions are done. Here's my offer to you. Our pro program coaches high school juniors from start to finish through the process. Um, we're hands-on through the whole thing to ace every aspect of the applications. We've already sold out the first three cohorts, but we still have some slot, slots left. Um, so if the academies is at the top of your list, then I highly recommend you sign up for a free discovery call to see if this is a mutual fit. Um, Tori will put 
she's our executive assistant. She's fantastic. She'll put the link in the ch chat there. Click on it, find a time that works for you. We do them Tuesday and Thursday nights usually. Okay. Um, so if you're a high school junior, that's for you. Um, if you're serious about potentially moving forward, you want to see if it's a mutual fit, then block some time with us, 30 minutes, and we'd love to get to know you. Um, for high school sophomores and freshmen, it's the same link, but we have an underclassmen program that coaches freshmen and sophomores through the whole process to prepare them to eventually be juniors and seniors and ace the crap out of it. It's very strategic. I love it because you're making you're making decisions that affect your resume and you're building your candidacy up to eventually be someone that crushes the actual application itself. But both things need to occur. So you can either wait until it's too late or you can get started now. Um, so really believe in both. Obviously our success rate speaks for itself, but um, it just depends on who you are and what, what stage of the game you're in. Um, but use that same link if you're a freshman or sophomore and want to inquire about our programs. So can, in conclusion, here's, here's what we talked about. And this is, this, is, this is what I want you to remember. Lots of applicants have volunteer service hours. Lots of applicants are members of clubs, members of varsity sports. It's going to take more than that. To differentiate yourself, you need to lead with a goal of four or more senior leader positions and selective and recognizable activities, ideally. But at the end of the day, get four or more, no matter what it's in. Lead. Get that on your resume. Let that shout to admissions. Second, lots of applicants have good grades. It's going to take more than that. To differentiate yourself, you need an above the mean SAT or ACT. Take it early, take it often, take it seriously to be proud of your score. This is why Academy Endeavors exists. We exist to elevate others so that they can accomplish their dreams. We say that every week in our team staff meeting. Everyone should be able to get into the Academy. No longer should the Academy be for the politically well-connected, the athletically elite, okay? It's for everyone, it should be for everyone. So we demystify this process to give everyone a chance, a fighting chance. That's why we exist. Thank you so much for your attention and your time. Um, now you can unmute or ask questions in the chat. Yeah, so if, if they're using the competitive method, um, then yes, it's a box that's checked. You have to have a nomination in order to get directly into the academy into any of the service academies besides Coast Guard Academies. Okay, Coast Guard Academy, you do not it does not require, their Department of Homeland Security, they don't require a, a, a congressional nomination. Um, but yes, if they're using the competitive method, what they're gonna do is they're gonna nominate 10 people. They have 10 slots per year per academy. They get 10 per academy per year for the four academies, <clears throat> the five minus, minus Coast Guard. And um, you want to be in that top 10 or your son or daughter wants to be in that top 10. Okay. And then that top 10 goes to the academy and the academy picks the one they want. And they can also pick alternates. So you don't have, have to be number one. You could be number two and they could, because they don't fill the class. There's only 435 districts. So just do the math. If they have a class of 1100, they, they're only 435 are the number one they still got the rest of the class. So they're going to fill them some with recruited athletes, probably 200 recruited athletes. So now that's 635. They got 100 senators. Now that's 735. They got about 90 enlisted. Okay, that, now that's 825. We're still not at 1,100. So they're going to have to go back and find alternates. Does that make sense? Yes. As you want to, so you want to know what method they use. Most, most, like 95% of congressional nomination sources that we work, that we've worked with over the last three or four years, have used the competitive method. So that's likely what yours is as well. You would go on the con congressman's website to verify that. And if they didn't have it on there, you can ask the staffer. It's usually an email uh, address or a phone number. Um, is your son or daughter a junior, senior? Or junior. Junior, yeah. So you're doing your homework a little bit early, which is good. So you reach out. You can reach out to the staffer and they can tell you for sure. But yes, most likely it is the competitive method, which would mean your son or daughter needs to be in the top 10. Thank you. No problem. 
All right, I'm going to go to the chat. When is it recommended, in your opinion, to begin practicing for academy interviews? How many months before? So we recommend over the summer, going into your senior year, the reason, uh, anywhere between May and August, that time frame. Why do we recommend that? Because academy liaison officers and are, are start reaching out over the summer, and you don't want to prepare too early and then be rusty. The second reason it is in the fall is when your congressional nomination interviews are, and that's going to be probably November is when most of them are. October, as early as October, okay? So we prep all of our clients over the summer. That's when we do it. And if they need a refresher, we do that in the fall, right before the congressional nominations. Um, but we don't suggest you start now because it's just too early. There's too many things to, to do now. So good question. Hi, Odwin. Edwin, um, can I apply to West Point with just taking the ACT and do I have to take the essay as well? So yes, you, you can apply to West Point just with the ACT. You don't need to take the SAT. ACT will satisfy the requirement and you want to do the writing portion of the ACT. So yes, do the writing portion as well. Carrie Pewitt, hi Carrie. For middle school students who homeschool, what is your advice on how to be ready when entering high school? Homeschool students have it tough because they usually struggle in the extracurricular because sports <clears throat> and leadership roles are a little bit tougher. And so, whereas SAT and academics, you know, GPA is right down, right up their wheelhouse, um, you might have to go into the community for that. So, what do we recommend for homeschool students? They, you're not going to get any grace to say oh well you're homeschool so you don't need to prove that you're a leader nope you're still gonna have to do that so that's where boy scouts girl scouts comes in civil air patrol sea cadets comes in any community organizations like that come into play um that's where we see you might be able to inquire at the local high school for varsity sports we have homeschool students that do that um so that works out well uh sometimes the homeschool co-ops actually have clubs like STEM clubs or like a DECA club or a 4-H club or something. Um, I would be reaching out if I were a parent of a middle school student that was homeschooled, I'd be reaching out to the either the network, the co-op, um, if there is such, to find out if there were any any selective and rec recognizable organizations like do they have a student council? Um, and if there is absolutely nothing, you're going to have to get everything through the community. Uh, and so that sports teams are going to come through the high school um, or clubs, club sports teams. <clears throat> uh, the problem with club sports teams, the challenge is, is that they typically don't have team captain positions and academies historically um, have put a lot of emphasis on that. It's a drop down menu in every single academy application. Were you a team captain or not? And because it's a drop down, they're, they're signaling to you what they're looking for. Um, and so if you get, if you're really into like martial arts and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, um, you know, some other things, some other sports in the community, that's the main one is like the martial arts. But uh, if you're really into those things and there's no leadership position, then I would be on the hunt to try to find some other ones that, that do. Um, so yeah, you're gonna have to go into the community or get aggressive about what the local high schools have. Good question. Okay, so what is the other type of method besides competitive? The answer is principle, the principle method. The principle method is, so for everyone listening up, the question is, what is the other type of congressional nomination method besides competitive? So the, the reason, the answer is principle. Principle is where they actually rank, order the top 10, and they actually declare who the number one is and they're telling, they're signaling to the academy which one they want to be picked in the district, okay? If you win your principal nomination, it's extremely valuable because that says if you're qualified, meaning if, you, if you're medically qualified and if you have the minimum GPA and SAT requirements and, um, and you pass your CFA, you're getting in. So if there's a principal method, you wanna know about it, 
and I, you want to work your ass off to try to be number one because if you get number one you're getting your appointment soon after that as long as you're min minimally qualified good question so what score do you advise for act essay i think it's out of 10. most of our clients are getting like eight or nine that's fine it, it doesn't really factor in they just need to see it and they want to read it to see what your writing looks like so they actually get that writing and they can compare that with your essays um yes a s a t did away with the the writing portion the a c t did not um so just do as well as you can um and eight or nine is a good score and i understand a varsity sport team captain is important what can we do if varsity sports don't offer team captains excuse me when talking with the coaches they don't want to have designated team captains is there a way for academies to know to this without seeming like I never got team captain at all? Yes, the answer is with the, we've had clients that have had that. And the answer is we put it in the sub bullet of the resume of the of the resume, the professional resume. And then we also when we convert it over to the academy application, we write per coach's policy team uh, coach does not designate team captains. We put that in the in the character limit, like the little comment box. We write that in and make it clear um so that it won't be held against them unfortunately i think the system still probably holds it against them as far as the computer goes but i think the human element looking over in the admissions board will be able to see that hope that makes sense what are the top extracurriculars you would rec recommend for me to take there is a long list um there is no particular extracurricular but i would say this um Look at what you're passionate about. Look at what you're good at, because those are things that you're going to do without even thinking about it. Right. Life's too short. Um, and then look at things that have leadership roles. The combination of all three is going to be your best bet. So if it's a sport, I don't care if it's football or tennis. There's not any more any more points because it's football or swimming. You know, like it doesn't have to be some physical sport as long as it's a sport. Um, Selective and recognizable, that's the framework there. And then as far as individual, we look at what you're passionate about, what you're good at, and what has leadership roles, okay? So that, that'll guide you. Has Trail Life USA been recognized by Academy Admissions yet? It's not in the dropdown. We can actually look, it's not in the dropdown, um, but I know what you're talking about, and it's a recent development, a lot of these, um a lot of these organizations like that's a branch off i believe from boy scouts or girl scouts um and so you would just in the sub would explain that it's similar to boy scouts and i'm pretty like that would be just fine so um yeah good question it's not in the actual drop down but there again you just qualify it in the sub bullet or in the comment box okay I know you've talked about the importance of RC sports, but would being the captain of a JV team help it as well? That's something you can write in the comment box of the Academy application resume portion, but it's not something that's actually clickable in one of their radio buttons or one of their drop downs. Okay. So still somewhat valuable, but we don't know how much because it's not even there's not even points assigned to it. So the real emphasis is on the varsity side. Juliana, hi Juliana. How should I find places to take the SAT rather than my high school? My school only offers it once a year, only to juniors and seniors. Um, you can take the SAT in the community. Just go on the SAT website, and there's all sorts of testing centers all around the country. So that shouldn't be an issue. You, know, you might have to drive if you're in a rural area. Um, you might even have to get a hotel. That's happened before. Drive, drive out on a Friday night. Most of them are testing on Saturday mornings. Drive out on Friday night, get a hotel, and then, you know, with a parent and take out the next morning. Um, do what you got to do. But you won't be the first if you do that. Believe me. Ivan, have you had any cases where you've worked with candidates in Puerto Rico? Not, not we haven't, you, we haven't worked with any in Puerto Rico. I do, I am familiar with the federal Title Ten regulations that talk about Puerto Rico and other U.S. territories like American Samoa. So it's there. Um, we worked with overseas clients all the time. We've worked with international um, 
we had we've had clients in Hong Kong, Italy, Canada, um, and talked to a bunch outside of that. Indonesia, uh, yeah, those are those are, I think the four countries that were under contract with us. But we've talked to a lot more than that. So you wouldn't be the first um, if you know to to apply or feel like don't feel like you're too isolated, even though I know you probably do. Um, but yeah. Puerto Rico has its own set of nomination criteria. Lucas, I'm a senior and I've submitted everything and got my nomination. Congrats. After the nomination is submitted into the portal, what time frame should you expect a decision? Lucas, most of the nominate most of the appointments come out between in February and March time frame. That's when the wave of appointments. The LOAs come out in the fall. And then it's just on a rolling basis. Most come out February, March. Depends on the academy. It depends which one you apply to. Um, kind of changes a little bit from year to year. But they're going to get out everything by April 15th. So April 15th is the day when everything will come. And why is that? Because when April 15th is the no kidding deadline, but most will come out before then. Okay, February, March time frame. All right, Sean, hey, Sean, uh, for sports, what about team versus individual? Um, earlier in the algorithm, when we go back and look at some RAND publications, they talk about doing more points to team sports, but I've heard academy admissions departments say they did away with that. So team and in individual sports are, are the same, same point value. Yeah, it used to be they used to actually give more points to like, the renowned sports, baseball, football, basketball, not the case anymore. Doan, hi Doan. Um, how does race affect academy admissions? As an Asian, I've heard I must be really competitive because most Asians are really competitive in academics. So um, the academy, let's talk about race for a second. Obviously it's not the most fun topic because it's always controversial, but I think it's, definitely a great question and um it's something everyone's thinking about so i'll address it right away or right up front um the supreme court left out the service academies from that uh overturn law um as far as being race blind and admissions um so academies still can look at race they can factor in race in terms of their needs for officer recruiting um they have all that within their prerogative what we've seen in our three years, three, four years of doing this is that underrepresented minorities, um, academies are looking for them. Why? Because historically they've had a low turnout in the applicant pool. And so, um, and representation in the officer ranks is important to them. Um, and so because of that, <clears throat> how does it affect you? Well, it, it can be an advantage if in that year in that applicant pool, there are less Asians applying then you're a smaller fish in a, you're a bigger fish in a smaller pond, so to speak, okay? So it can be to your advantage. And an underrepresented minority is just anybody that is underrepresented compared to the officer ranks that they're looking for, all right? So uh, we have a lot of minorities in our, in our cohorts um, and we appreciate their perspect, unique perspective, especially when they're first generation American, um, how much they love America. I love working with them. And I would say it's more of an advantage than a disadvantage. So don't hear from it being a disadvantage at all. I don't think it is. I think the Academy admissions departments highly value the diversity that you guys bring. Ivan, um, Puerto Rico congressional district, whether it uses principal or competitive, I don't know that offhand, Ivan. Um, we'd have to do some more research and talk to the staff there. Here's the thing about principal versus competitive uh methods it changes when representatives change which there's elections every two years so so for some of these representatives for senators it's every six so it can change over right i live in north carolina senator burr richard burr retired ted budd took his place ted budd's first year in office he used the principal method we weren't used to that uh, north carolina clients that were like bud used principal method Okay, and we're, we're learning as we go. Why? Because there's a changeover in office. So we have to reach out to the staff and find those things out. Luca, 
You mentioned how important the SAT and ACT are for admissions. How important are AP exams and how do they tie into the process? They're not that important, actually. So let me back up, okay? <laughs> I've given you my honest off the cuff. Um, if you get the AP Scholar or AP Scholar with Honors Award because you got more than four, fours and five, multiple fours and fives on AP tests, can you put that in your resume as, a, as an award? Yes. Can it be viewed highly? Yes. And then your sub bullet, you can say, got a five on the Calc BC AP. That has to matter. It does matter. It's looked at. It was, you submitted it. Now, are the academies asking for your AP exam scores? No, they're not asking for them. So if you got a two or a one or a three, they're not even going to find out unless you self-report and tell them in, your, in the resume portion. So it can't hurt you. It cannot hurt you. But it can help you when it comes to if you get a four or five and you want to showcase it and put it in the resume portion, you can. Okay, so hopefully that's more clear. I would say if you're stressed out, and we tell this to clients all the time in the spring, if you're stressed out, final exams are way more important than AP exams because sometimes they overlap. So we need, we need to make priorities here. Final exams are more important because that's your transcript. Is the academy going to see your transcript? Yes. Is that important? Yes. Okay. SAT, ACT, is that important? Yes. Those are the two things they're asking for to test academic robustness. AP exams, it was not in my presentation because it's not part of academic robustness. But if you do get a four or five, you can showcase it. Okay. And then you, um, Luca also asked, will the academies have a preference toward captions of larger or smaller teams? My swim team is rather small. Um, no. No, because in the drop down you'll put varsity swim and then you'll check check captain. Uh, there won't be a distinguishment. They're not asking how big is the team and then discounting you if your team's only five people. Janice, my daughter is American Heritage Girls, which is similar to Girl Scouts. Will she be awarded the same amount of points? Let me be upfront with some of the proprietary methods that they score. The details of this, nobody knows and if they tell you they're like if if i say well girl scouts is 25 and heritage american heritage is 24. i don't know that nobody does because that's proprietary it's under a um, confidential restriction that anybody's involved in admissions has a non-disclosure agreement that means it would break the law for them to tell anybody okay so i don't i know directionally based on publicly available data that's what we do our research on and by, based on years of getting in the nitty gritty with clients, and that's how we're able to directionally tell you, okay? So I don't know if it's gonna be the same or not. And I hope you appreciate my honest answer. At the same time, what I would tell you is clarifying that in the sub bullets, making sure it's clear what it is, because a lot of academy admissions departments won't know about it. I, don't, I didn't know what American Heritage Girls was, okay? Whereas Girl Scouts and the Gold Award is in every drop down in the book for these academies, okay? So clarifying that, clarifying your impact, making it, um, <clears throat> describing that in 255 characters or less, okay? And if she's president or the equivalent of president, explaining that in layman's terms is highly effective. And if there's an essay about it, et cetera, explaining that in a few minute words, but still being clear, that's what we're talking about. That would, that would help give her, um, the the boost that, that you're looking for Kaden, um <clears throat> do those that play multiple sports get more credit i play hockey and it's almost year round equivalent to a fall winter and spring sport so here's how they do athletic activities it's number of sports times number of years varsity letter winners times number of years as team captain okay and all got that that's the inputs the inputs are how many sports they're going to ask you're going to select a drop down you select a sport they're going to ask how many years that were your varsity letter winner 9 10 11 and 12 how many boxes did you check next they're going to ask you how many years were you varsity team captain check 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 how many checks do you have how many check marks you have is how many points you're going to have for athletic activities <clears throat> okay so if you play hockey and another sport now you have two opportunities to put check marks for varsity letters team sports and special honors or awards that's the other one okay if you play one sport and it's year round like cheerleading is very common one sport and it's year round maybe or or track is another one 
because they got indoor track and outdoor track. Try to distinguish, try to break it up. Spring hockey, fall hockey, or something. Um, to make sure you can show admissions the weight of what you're doing and how it is year round. Otherwise, if you just play one sport, they're gonna assume, well, great, you play hockey in the winter, but what did you do in the fall and spring? Luca, how much of a how much can a job I'm scrolling back up here? I got a long question. How much of a job can lifeguard play into the process? Jobs are important. Jobs where you have a managerial role or a supervisor role are much more important. Okay, so a job can a job is is job is like participation in a club. You're a member. Great. A lot of people work over the summer. Lifeguard. Okay. So it's like being a member of a club. See if there's a supervisor role, like in my success story where he was a manager. Um, now that's hard to get. I understand that a 17 year old, but if it's something you've worked there for four years, perhaps like in a restaurant, perhaps you can get a manager a role or some sort of role where you're supervising somebody, because that is actually a question that's asked in the application is, did you have an opportunity to be a manager or supervisor or boss? But that goes far. Okay. Duan asked, does the type of sport affect when they give a point for it? I'm a captain of RC bowling, but I don't think it's significant. I think we asked that or answered that already. The answer is no. Um, it doesn't matter what type of sport. Bowling would be just as legit as football. Jason. Hey, Jason. 75% of your clients got an LOA. Even based on being well qualified and submitted. Did you find that having an LOA helped gain nomination to said academy? We're nervous about where we get a nomination to not matching up with the academy that would offer an appointment and missing out on an appointment. We might just be overthinking it. Um, LOAs signal to the nomination sources that you're a highly attractive candidate to the admissions department. So I believe it, it does help. Um, there's no stats on that congressional nomination offices because they turn over and they hardly have any data to show for it, like no publicly available data. Uh, I don't have like the research to show to tell you, but in my experience, all those LOAs that we've had, all of them got nomination. Now all of our clients have got nomination. So that's not as strong of a point there, but think thinking about it from, we have, I have had several friends, former colleagues be, in congressional nomination advisory boards or selection panels and they can find out like the the admissions departments um can tell the nomination sources i got an loa i i this is this candidate got an loa and and if they don't you as the candidate can tell them i got an loa um and i just wanted to let you know you know, you're being humble about it, but you're you're letting them know that you got an LA. Now it's still not a lock because their their selection process is separate and independent of the academies. So they have they're independent of that completely, but it's a signal. It's a strong signal that the academies are telling them they're very interested, so interested they're reserving a seat. So yes, it can affect the nomination in a good way. <clears throat> All right, it's getting late on East Coast time. I'm going to take these two questions. <clears throat> this has been really fun, guys. Um, how would being a, I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong, sensei, sensei, present itself? Would it be like a team captain or more like a separate thing? So you're an instructor, essentially, of a martial art. Um, and it would be looked at kind of like a camp counselor uh, or an assistant volunteer coach of a youth team is kind of how it would be looked. So not as much a leadership role, okay? Because you're not leading your peers. Um, you're kind of coaching or doing volunteer. Um, so yeah, it's not a true like leadership role. Caden, how many letters of recommendation would you suggest submitting to the academies? Depends on the academy. Um, West Point requires four and there's no optional. Um, you can submit to your admissions officer, separate one. I wouldn't bombard them with a ton of recommendation letters. I would give them the four. And then if you have a special one, maybe five for West Point. Um, Naval Academy requires two, and then they have three optional. 
uh, Air Force Academy requires three, and then there's two optional, so that's a total of five. Coast Guard Academy is five. Merchant Marine Academy is five. So it's pretty much five except West Point. So I would say five. Once you get into the six, seven range, it's like who's who has time to read all this? You know, it's it's the same message. You got a math teacher, an English teacher, a third optional teacher, and then two from the community, whether it's a coach, Boy Scout troop, ma Scout master, et cetera. You want to do a 360 degree view of who you are. And so you want to be asking people that can speak into. So math is going to speak into STEM. English is going to speak into your humanities proficiency. Another teacher might speak into maybe physics or chemistry, might speak into that. You might have a principal or administrator or club teacher sponsor speak into your character and leadership and maybe your uh, ability on the field might come from your coach and so that would be the five and that would be a 360 degree view of who you are that's what you want to think about of who you want to ask um and then ivan asked may you share with us if possible the highlights of your high school resume that has allowed you to earn an appointment ivan and i'm telling this to everybody don't do what i did 20 years ago okay I formed this whole company so it'll be opposite of everything I did because I got lucky and I wish I hadn't done it the way I did. Okay. So I was team captain of my varsity football team. Um, I can't remember my GPA. Um, but I also came in the back door because I got a late recruit recruited athlete blue chip. Okay. Which allowed me to go to the academy. And we I don't shy away from that. That was just part of my story. Um, so, you know, if you're a blue chip recruited athlete, that's a great way to get into the academy. So for anybody that's on the call, if that is in your, in your wheelhouse, we have helped uh, some of our clients become recruited athletes. Um, it's not typically our niche, but, um, we have helped some, um, that is a great leverage with admissions because essentially they flag your file with admissions and then you're able to um just meet the minimum and, and get and get through um i was not your typical because i was a good student and very involved but i didn't have near the resume that some of these some of my clients do now even the client even the clients that i showed that did not get accepted the resume there it's become more competitive over time because just one last tidbit one last pro tip congress has fixed the amount of slots. Congress has said, 50, you know, 50, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, they said there can be no more than this amount that go to these academies. Well, guess what? In 1950, you know, the United States of America had half the people it has now. And a lot, even less, we're trying to go to college. We've doubled our population and most people are going to trying to go to college, but the academies are still offering the same amount of appointment slots when you treble or triple or quadruple the demand and the supply stays the same what happens it gets ultra competitive and that's what's happening so all right guys very 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 good chatting with y'all 